Returning to Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. Last week we looked at Leviticus, actually the past two weeks, we look at, looked at Leviticus chapter 8. Before I actually read anything from 11, let me briefly summarize chapter 9 and chapter 10 to bring us up to chapter 11. This will be on tape if you want it later, if you do, if you don't, fine too. Chapter 9 teaches us this one central thing. Nobody is outside the fall of Adam. Aaron had to offer up offering first for his own sins before he could even offer up for the sins of the people. Hebrews takes this up and acknowledges that fact, but introduces, no, declares the fact that Christ is superior to Aaron. Amen. He did not have to offer up for his own sins. He had to offer up for our sins. That's right. That's right. So none is outside the fall. That's the central theme of chapter 9. Chapter 10, we have three main thoughts. Briefly, self-will is damning. You see that today in that... Uh, Nadab and Abihu. Oh, yeah. They offered strange fire. That is, they got their live coals from the wrong place. That's all they did. That's it. Yeah. But that's all they did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and God killed them boys right there. Yes, sir. He killed them. Well, fire come out from God and killed them. So that's in chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Secondly, we must beware of emotion. We must beware of emotion. Now, emotion there is not wrong, but we must beware of emotion. Aaron and his the remaining sons were told, don't you cry for him, boys. Yeah. Don't you mourn. Let Israel mourn, yeah. but you're about the business of God. Now you go back and you can read that. Yes, but it also says to promote sobriety. Now the context clearly is physical sobriety. Yeah. They were not to be under the influence of alcohol when they were in the tabernacle performing the service of God. Exactly. But that has a New Testament qualification as well that we are to be sober minded yes there are a lot of people that ain't never alcohol ain't never touched their lips but they are not sober minded that's in chapter 10 verses 4 through 11 and in chapter 10 verses 12 through 20 we see this <coughs> men can err men can err without malicious intent they can Aaron did he did not eat of the meat of the sin offering when he was supposed to. But he had valid reason, at least in his mind and Moses' mind. But never assume that God still owes you his favor. Never assume. In other words, don't let that become the norm. In other words, it's not all about sincerity because you can be sincerely wrong but as I began to read through some of these things I thought well I could preach in chapter 9 10 for three or four more months if not years and I thought no I'm not going to do that I want to go on to chapter 11 chapter 11 contains my subject let me read a summary of this subject and the summary is here in chapter 11 itself verse 43 ye shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall ye make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereby. Four. Now we're actually given the reason for all of these commands. Yes, sir. And there is a bunch of these commands, a bunch of different animals mentioned as clean and unclean. Yeah. And so forth and so on. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. And it's one of the only places you're going to hear that mentioned. But yeah. remember the context. It's set yourself apart under the things that are clean. There you go. Avoid the things that are unclean. Exactly. Sanctify yourselves and ye shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And then we see a second or I should say higher reason even still. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt. There you go. Remember, in Leviticus now, they're still camped at the base of Sinai. We will not see them move out 
until we get to the next book. And they begin to then move out. And some say they were there about a year. Maybe so. But I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt <coughs> to be your God. Amen. Ye shall therefore be holy. Now this is not a command. The first statement was a command. Yeah. This is a declaration. Yeah. This is a declaration. Ye shall therefore be holy. Not because you sanctify yourselves, but because I am holy. Amen. You see, you're not going to have the holiness of verse 44 unless you first got that of verse 45. That's exactly right. Although 44 is mentioned first, 45 took place first. He began bringing them up Amen. out of Egypt. Yes, sir. Somebody says, that's your take. That's the truth. That's just the truth. This is the law of the beasts and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and every creature that creepeth upon the earth to make a difference between the clean and the unclean and between the beasts that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. My title is this, The Gospel Typified in Dietary Law. I will step out on a limb because I certainly not read every writer on this subject, so I can't say that personally about every writer. But any man who thinks he could take each one of these distinctions between clean and unclean beasts and make some New Testament or New Covenant type and show it is just wet behind the ears because they are all meant to show this one thing. There are things that are clean, and there are things that are unclean, and those who are redeemed by God need to eschew, they need to avoid, they need to run away from, if necessary, the unclean, but it's more than that. They need to lay hold of the clean. A lot of people feel real well about themselves because there are a lot of unclean things they won't touch. But they won't touch the clean things either. That's exactly right. That's exactly. They won't touch the clean things either. So again, the gospel typified in dietary law. Turn to Galatians chapter 2 and then I will make a statement and we'll read a passage there. Galatians chapter 2. Remember our the context, we're talking about unclean animals, creeping things, and beasts, and birds, and fish, insects, all kinds of things. And I'm saying this is the gospel typified in dietary law. Now maybe you'll get the gist of how I'm going to approach this this morning by this statement. Are you at Galatians chapter 2? Listen to my statement, and then I'll show you that from the scripture. Do not try... And hand me a chameleon and tell me it's a grasshopper. You know what I just said? Think about that for a while. Don't hand me a chameleon and try to tell me it's a grasshopper. A, and I specifically use that for a reason. A chameleon is clearly declared to be one of the unclean creeping things, correct? A grasshopper was declared to be a clean thing, correct? But what is one of the characteristics that really stand out in a chameleon? He blends in with his circumstances. Now some say he does that to hide from predators. That may be partly so, but the chameleon is a predator. He blends in for his belly's sake to start with. His belly sake. Now, here's Galatians. What's going to happen if you hand me, and I don't just mean me, or you, if you truly believe the tr truth, what's going to happen if someone hands you a chameleon and tells you it's a grasshopper? Here's what you should do. Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. Paul is talking about he goes up to Jerusalem. Why? And that because of false brethren. Yeah. Unawares, they are chameleons. Exactly. You hear me? Yeah. They are chameleons. 
and that because of false brethren unaware brought in who came in privily or that is secretly to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. And Paul says, I just tried to get along with them as much as I could. Yeah. Is that what he goes on to say? Well, I decided we ought to have a debate. No. Here's what happens. Here's what ought to happen whenever you try to hand one of God's redeemed ones, one of his sanctified ones, you try to hand them a chameleon and tell them it's a grasshopper to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. And why? So that we might stand out? So that our wisdom and power might be seen in its prowess? No, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these which seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. The problem is the unclean will always affect the clean. And I'll use a phrase, I hope you understand it. The clean never baptizes the unclean. The clean never sanctifies the unclean to make it clean. Exactly. So don't try to hand us a chameleon and try to tell us it's a grasshopper. These dietary laws are symbols, or more <laughs> particularly, more a better word, especially that is, is, the, is the, from the translation of the KJV, is these dietary laws are types. In other words, the clean equals this, truth. Truth, truth, the unclean equals heresy. Yeah. Amen. You know what I said? That's right. Heresy. heresy. And someone says, but pastor, that's a strong word. Yeah, it is a strong word. But you remember reading Leviticus chapter 11? These are just critters. Yeah, that's it. And 10 times, God calls some of them abominable. Does he not? That's a strong word. Yes, Just for critter meat. Yeah, exactly. Now we know. I was taught when I was young. Maybe you was in a place like me years ago. Maybe you weren't. I was taught that these dietary laws for Israel had to do with health reasons. Yeah. As though somehow beef is better than pork. Yeah. You know, the other white meat. Yeah. Exactly. It has nothing to do with health. Health. And I'll tell you why. It also talks about vessels and clothes and skins and sacks and pots and seeds and water. Does it not? Yes, sir. And if a thing, just an unclean thing, especially if it was dead, just touched one of these things, that thing became clean until what? Even. You know what it says? And you know all you had to do to make it clean again? Did you read it? Just wash it with water. Now, how many of you are just going to take something that's got an unclean animal carcass in it, just dump out that carcass and just rinse it out with water, just let it set till night, and then start using it again? You're going to get out the Dawn and the Clorox and everything else, and you're going to cleanse that thing. Yes, sir. This ain't about health. This is ceremonial law. It is carnal ordinances meant to establish greater, better divine truth. And I can prove that to you. So you see, do not insult the truth of God's Son. You hear me? Amen. Here's the real danger. Here's the real difference between the clean and the unclean. This is the beginning. If you get the beginning wrong, everything else will be wrong. Exactly. Paul said if you preach any other gospel, then other than what's already been preached, what's already been established, you can go to hell. Yeah, that's, what he said. that's what he says. Let them. Let them. Take your hands off of it. Let them be accursed. Why? Because I'm some, some great thing? 
No, but because we're talking about the honor of God the Father's precious, blessed Son. Amen. That's right. His Son. Exactly right. So do not insult that. Moreover, these are said to be, turn to Hebrews chapter 7. I'll make another statement and then show you the scripture. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 7. Moreover, these are said to be carnal ordinances, and that's what they were. Now, the word carnal here don't mean something wicked or evil. It means they were earthly, fleshly, physical things. And the book of Hebrews says they were carnal ordinances, and I want you to hear what their end is. Uh -huh. Hebrews chapter 7, just a few verses, verse 18 and 19 first. Hebrews 7, 18 and 19. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And why is that? Because of these verse 16 carnal commandments, they could not establish what they typified. You see, no goat, no blood of a goat or of a lamb or of a bullock could take away sin. But that's my chief problem is my sin. My sin is what separates me from God. And moreover, Christ was not of the tribe of Levi. And it was illegal. It was unclean for anyone outside the tribe of Levi to officiate in the priest's office, Amen. right? Yeah. But Jesus is of a higher order of priesthood, Amen. one who came before the law, yes, Melchizedek. So now we're up to speed. For this is verily a, what's that next word? Yeah. Yes. Disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Now, if you think that just because you eat grasshoppers and not chameleons that God will accept you into his presence, you are deceived. You could follow all of these dietary laws, but you still had to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Amen. And you had to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. You see? Look, for the law, and what, what, what part of the law? The law. The law. All the law. Not that the law is bad. The law, the law's problem wasn't the law. The law's problem was me. Amen. The law's problem was you. Yes. It's our depravity. Yes, sir. I, I can abstain from eating certain things. Yes. I can make myself do that. Do you know that? Yes. I can make myself do that. But I cannot make myself love my neighbor as myself. Because I don't like you as much as I like me. That's it. That's it. Now, not everybody. There's some folks say, "Well, that's not me." Then you've not seen you yet. God's not really shown you you yet, because you are that. I pray God shows it to you. But look, for the law, what made nothing? How much? Nothing perfect. But one of the Blessed, one of the most blessed words in the Holy Scripture. But the bringing in of a better hope did, and I know it's interpolated, but it's, it's meant to be in a part of the text, did by the which, that is this better hope, by the which we draw nigh unto God. One more, chapter 9, speaking about the same thing. Verse 8, the Holy Ghost. Talk about all of these tabernacle things and yes, all of these legal things. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing and it stood for hundreds of years. Yes, and then when it was decommissioned, yeah. what then stood? A stone temple then stood. Yes, sir. And then when it was broke down, they built another one. And then when it went off the scene, Herod came along and built another one. When Christ came on the scene, it wasn't but about 
oh, well, a few years, in 70 A.D., that temple was destroyed, and they ain't been one since. Hmm? Yes, sir. They ain't been one since. Look, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service, the service perfect as pertaining to conscience which stood only in meats and drinks, you see it, and divers washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation, but Christ. You see it? But Christ. There's the better hope. Briefly. Consider the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. Most people think I'm talking about the Old Testament versus the New Testament. That is not so. The Old Testament speaks both of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The New Testament speaks of both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the Old Covenant was given first. But the New Covenant existed in the mind and purpose of God and was actually revealed to man before the old covenant ever was revealed to man. As soon as man fell, God revealed the new covenant because he said the seed of the woman is coming. Amen. You see, there's the new covenant. Yes, but think about, consider old covenant versus new covenant. Old covenant, it was literal and it was compulsive for Israel. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, Paul puts it this way. If today, if even today, you're trying to live under the rules of the Old Covenant, you are subject to all the rules of the Old Covenant. Amen. Because the Old Covenant says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Amen. So if you seek to tithe to get God's favor, you got to eat the right kind of food too. And if you tithe and you seek to eat the right food, then you also have to offer the correct sacrifices. Yes, sir. Well, Jesus is my sacrifice. Jesus is my everything. Amen. He's my clean food. Yes, sir. He's the one food I can eat and eat all I want, and I don't have to worry about being defiled by it. Exactly. Is he not? There's not one thing about him that is unclean. He ain't got one dung beetle anywhere near him. Right. Mm. Old covenant. It was literal and compulsive. According to Paul, I'm not even going to turn to it. According to Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, he says all meats, all creatures are ordained of God for food. Yes, sir. Isn't that what he says? <coughs> now, we'll let me see how I can explain that away. You don't have to explain it away. And he's talking about God's people. Yes, sir. Because if you're an unbeliever, if you're unregenerate, even your plowing is sin. Amen. Even when you plow your garden to plant your seeds, to get your food, to do your canning, to feed your little babies during the winter, it's still sin. You're right. Sin. Amen. How can that be? Because God is absolute holy. We're under the fall. Everything we do, our best deeds are filthy rags. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. How? In God's sight. Amen. Now granted, we, there are good, good things that men ought to live decent in this world. It makes for better living in this world. But that only gives me fa us favor between one another. It does not give us favor with God. God demands absolute perfection, else the law and just attempting would have been enough. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If I screw up, if I sin, get you a go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There you go. Uh -huh. But those things could not take away sin. Secondly, consider this old covenant versus new covenant. <coughs> The old covenant says, you will keep me perfectly. Amen. You will keep me perfectly. Then God comes along on the scene and says this. I said God comes along on the scene. He came on the scene in, a, in human flesh. Amen. Listen to what he says. 
This is what he says to the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, and that's never changed. That's exactly it was right. true under the old covenant, just as true as, just as it's true under the new covenant. Yes, sir. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then I'm a goner. Exactly. <laughs> right? That's what it ought. If God's given you life, that's first when you read that, you'll say, that's scary. It causes the hair to stand up on the back of my neck. But I want you to know how God throws a cog in this thing now. Yes, sir. You hear what I'm saying? Look at it. You know you're not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't you be deceived. Yeah. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. Well, preacher, just tell me what that really means. You know exactly what those things mean. There you, go. you know what they are. Yes, and if you don't, I'm amazed you're not locked up in prison even today under man's law. The reason you're not, because you fear those things a little bit, or you slipped up and somebody caught you, maybe they locked you up for a while. But look, shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's unclean things. Yes or no? Those are unclean things. Man is not to partake of those unclean things. But we do. But we do. But look, and such were some of you. Something amazing's happened. But ye are washed. <laughs> Notice how God now infiltrates on the scene and in the person of his son just confounds the whole thing. He says, I'm going to take something that's unclean, yep. something that needs to be washed, I'm going to wash it. Amen. That's what that washing that unclean pot when you found the dead carcass of a rat in it. You dumped that carcass out and you rinsed it out real good and dumped out the water and let it set until even time. That's a testimony of the work of Jesus Christ for his people. Amen. That's, hmm. That's what it's all about. Yeah. What it's all about. Such you are washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we see those things. And then... All of a sudden, God comes on the scene. And Gentiles are considered to be, and rightfully so by law, Gentiles are considered to be unclean. Right? And when God is pleased, when the fullness of time had come for God to now begin to publicly, openly manifest that he's going to receive the Gentiles and graft them into the root stock of Israel. What's he do to Peter? Yeah. He lets down a big sheet. Yes, he did. And that big sheet's got catfish flopping around in it. That thing's got some dung beetles in it. It's got some rabbits in it. Maybe some camel meat. God said to Peter, Arise, slay, and eat. Yeah. And Peter said, No. Isn't that what he said? No, Lord. I've never eat anything that's unclean. And now God just stirs up the whole pot. Doesn't he? He said, Don't you call common or unclean that which I have cleansed. And he ain't talking here about food. We ain't talking about I can eat me some snake meat. Now, I ain't got nothing to do with that. No. Now, you want to eat snake meat, you go right ahead. I'm probably not going to. But that ain't the point. He's talking about people. Amen. You remember, we've already looked at it. You're not supposed to eat meat or drink blood. With, you're probably supposed to eat meat with the blood in it. Or drink the blood according to law, right? That's right. Don't do it. You hang up, even if it's a clean beast, Joe, that blood's for God. Yeah. And you let that thing drain out. Yeah. You, you bleed it, as we said. And then you don't take that like the heathen would do and take and drink that or cook that blood. Yeah. And then Jesus Christ comes along. What's he say? Yeah. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you ain't got no life in you. Yeah. That's stirring the pot. See, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. 
God has the right to do things as it pleases him. He can come in and disannul the law Amen. to honor his holiness and justice. And as a matter of fact, my, it, if my understanding of the testimony of the preponderant testimony of Scripture is true, God, because of his holy character, had to do that. He had to do that. He couldn't save one sinner unless Jesus Christ did everything he did when he came to this Amen. earth. That's right. So that is the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. But now I'm going to show you the Old Covenant shadowing the New Covenant. The clean diet was for clean people. Isn't that what we read here? You see, God didn't care what all those heathen. He didn't care what the Aztecs in South America were eating. That's right. Did he send them a law? Did he go deliver them out, out, out of that big Matsu Pichu or whatever? Did he deliver them from there and bring them all the way across the ocean and set them down in the land of Canaan? Hmm? He didn't give them no dietary law because he hadn't gave, given them any Christ. <laughs> he hadn't given them any Christ. This dietary law was only for those who had been brought up out of the land of Egypt. Yes, sir. Yes, they were clean people, but they were clean because they were first redeemed. Amen. That's right. Now we know that God may well have included some Aztecs in that. Because it had nothing about coming out of Egypt physically, any more than it had avoiding a chameleon physically. It had to do with God revealing to you your sin and the glory of his son. That's what it has to do with. It's clean versus unclean. Secondly, the type. Remember, it's more than critters. It had to do with vessels, clothes, skins, sacks, pits, <laughs> seeds, water, all these things. In other words, it's truth versus error. Truth versus heresy. Whether it's the gospel message we're preaching, whether it's the doctrine we're holding to concerning any aspect of Scripture, whether it has to do with our conduct, whether it has to do with our attitude, whether it has to do with our motives. Why? Because Paul reiterates the Old Testament command in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, all the way through chapter 7, verse 1. And Paul starts it out this way. Be ye not unequally yoked together. That's right. And he sums it up by quoting the Old Testament and says, Touch not the unclean thing. He's not talking about just food there or raiment there. The clothes of a leper had to be dealt with. Mason, you couldn't just get leprosy and say, Well, I, I can't use these no more than this sell them in a yard sale. Now, could you? Sometimes they had to be disregarded altogether. You see, he says, come out from among, and I mentioned this the other day, what, T-H-E-M, and he ain't talking about critters. He's talking about people. He's talking about people. Here's another thing, this type and shadow. I want you to see clean versus heresy. That is, or truth versus heresy. Clean versus unclean. I want to give you a few examples. I had nine, and I realized nine would be way too many to try to deal with this morning. But before I give you just these three examples, I want you to listen to me. Antichrist religion. When I say antichrist religion, this book talks about antichrist. Yes. John said antichrist already come. Yes, sir. One of antichrist's biggest deceiving things is he's convinced so many people, I'm not there yet, but I'll be there one day. The spirit of Antichrist is already in this world. That means Antichrist is here. Yes, sir. Just like the spirit of Christ is in me, Mac, that means Christ is in me, the hope of glory. Yes, and I'm tired of hearing people talk about Antichrist. Oh, that's somebody to come. He's here now. Yes, and his error surrounds us everywhere. Yes. And God is now saying, come out from among her. Be you separate. Because if you don't, you're going to partake of her plagues. And that woman rides a scarlet colored beast. And that beast is said what? He was and he is not. What's it say? And yet is. Right. Is. Amen. Is. 
Now, when I talk about Antichrist, I mean I don't mean anti-Jesus. But they are anti-Christ. There you go. Yeah. Because there's a lot of Jesuses out here that man's made up in his own mind. But there is but one Christ, and that's the one that accomplished everything the Father sent him to do. Amen. And Antichrist religion today does not warn us of clean versus unclean. That's, I'm not saying they never. They might tell you fornication's wrong. Don't commit fornication. Yeah. It's a whole lot more than that. Yes, sir. You can be the, <laughs> I guess, only, the least fornicator that ever walked. <laughs> You could be the most clean, unfornicating person that ever walked and still perish in a devil's hell. Yeah. Yes, sir. If you miss Christ, it don't matter how moral you are, you are unrighteous in God's sight. Amen. So Antichrist religion doesn't say, well, here's a chameleon, and we don't care. Let's just eat the chameleon. Mm -mm. No, they infiltrate and they try to use the clean, but they say, here's something that's clean. They'll try to pass off a possum as beef. They try to pass off an eel as a walleye. They try to pass off a dung beetle as a grasshopper. And can I prove that? Yes. Men talk about their will as being superior to God's will. Yeah, amen. Do they not? Yeah. Especially when it comes to salvation. Now, maybe not service because we all need to get into the will of God, don't you know? But when it comes to salvation, they express that man's will is superior to God's will. Boy. Am I lying on them? No, sir. Am, am I misrepresenting no, that? One reason I know I'm not is because I used to be one of them. There you go. That's it. Listen to what John wrote. John 1, he came into his own, his own received him not, this is Christ, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, that's what Joe was talking about, which were born, not of blood, and what's that next one? Nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, so man's will don't mean squat. I ain't saying man don't have a will. No. I'm saying this book says our will is as corrupt as our heart. Yes. And our hearts are desperately wicked. Yes. We are wounds and bruises and nasty stinking sores from the top of our head to the soles of our feet in God's sight. Amen. Mm. That's trying to give me some rat and say here's some lamb's meat. Exactly. When you try to push off human will on men and women. Here's another one. Charismatic self-glory. And try to push that off as the worship of Christ. Yeah, you're right. Remember a couple Sundays I missed. Couldn't be here. I wanted to be here. Yeah. I couldn't be here. So I, like any other idiot, turned on the TV and I was waiting for our broadcast to come on, but like any idiot, I turned it on too early, knowing I was turning it on too early. And there's a guy up there, and he's dancing around. He ain't talking about the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He talked about him, 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 and them, them, them. And, his, and goes over, and he just slaps his leg, and he's preaching. He was glorifying men. Amen. He was not preaching Christ. Amen. That's it. Here's the problem. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, here's one of the, one of the hallmarks of a true God-sent preacher. Verse 5, for we preach not ourselves. There you go. I am as sinful as you. Yes. And you are as sinful as me. That's right. And I am not your example. No. I am an insample. Because I show you how God's people ought to be when God works in them both the will and to do his good pleasure. And I, so, I show you exactly how God's people ought not to be when I start walking after the flesh rather than walking after the spirit. Yeah. When my mind is caught up with self. There you go. For we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Yeah. Same day. Listen to another one. 
preach for 25 minutes philosophically trying to encourage people to do what's right. I'm serious. And they said, now we'll take five minutes. Oh, he said, I won't be too long. And he preached about Jesus Christ. Yeah. They even told him, I ain't going to take long. Why? Because people don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. Yeah. Tell me what I can do. Exactly Tell me what I can do. That's trying to give me snake as goat meat. There you go. It's what it's trying to do. Yeah. It's not taking snake, Joseph, here's snake. Yeah. No, they dress it up. Take all the bones out. Take the skin off. Chop the head. Chop the tail. Just head you a chunk of meat. Say, here, here's goat meat. And when you've eaten it, you know what you've eaten? I don't care how good you think it is. Yeah. You've just eaten snake meat, yeah. not goat meat. Exactly. What about this one? Here's the last one. Decisionism and easy believism. You know we are swamped with that. Yeah. People are telling people, just make a decision for Jesus. The Bible doesn't say anywhere or even indicate you make the decision for Jesus. It says that believe in his heart that God raised him from the dead and that he is Lord. Amen. That's what it says. Yes, sir. And ease, I was brought up under ease. Come forward, just pray this prayer. God's got to save you. That's what we taught. Oh, yeah. Compare that to spirit wrought gospel regeneration. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How? Through sanctification of the Spirit. And that's got to happen first. Yes, sir. And belief of the truth. Therefore, if you're sanctified by the Spirit, the truth's going to be there somewhere. Yes, sir. And you're going to believe the truth yes, pretty soon. Because yes. God don't sanctify you just for you to float around sanctified. No. That's exactly right. Well, I'm sanctified. I don't believe in the Lord. But the, Lord, the Spirit sure worked on me. You're, you're full of it. You go on bonkers. You need to peel. It's sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And how do you get there? Whereunto he called you by our gospel, and they ate no other way. Exactly. Well, I had this great, marvelous experience. I'm happy for you. I don't doubt that you did, but that's not the way God does it. Exactly. Has nothing to do with decisionism or easy believism. That's somebody, now here's another, that's somebody trying to ha hand me a rabbit. Well, look at choose the cud. Now, what's wrong with deciding for Jesus, Joe? Huh? What's wrong with believing? Right? There's your rabbit. And he's chewing the cud, just like the cow is. But he ain't got a split hoof. He's an unclean animal. I don't care how you slice him up. Yeah. Chop his feet off. Unless God, he still didn't have a cloven foot. Exactly. And you can't dress up the lie of Antichrist and make it help anyone spiritually. Amen. Again, I say you can't chop off the rabbit's foot yeah. and then everything be okay because he's still rabbit meat. Now, I will sum this up. Preacher, somebody said, Preacher, you get worked up. I know because I remember where I was one time. Yeah. And I remember what it took go. for God to get me out of that. Yeah. It was an Egypt and bondage scenario. Yes, sir. Did you know that? Yeah. It was an Egypt and bondage scenario just as much as the, our brothers and sisters of Israel had back yonder. I was in just as much slavery as they were. Yeah. Now let me sum it up. Colossians 2. And he's writing this even to Laodicea. You remember the Laodiceans? Yeah. They evidently went downhill pretty quick. Yeah. Did they not? Yeah. One of the reasons may because they didn't pay heed to this right here. Yeah. Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Speaking of Christ. Briefly. Verse in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's talking about God the Father and of Christ. And this I say, lest any man should what? Here we go. Beguile you with enticing words. They'll dress up that unclean meat of that unclean beast and make it real presentable, but it's still an unclean beast. Exactly. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order. And what else? and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, 
That's the same way you ought to walk. So walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, <coughs> and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. As I said, there is no unclean meat in Jesus Christ. Beware, lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy and empty deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world. And what does that mean? It means anything other than Christ. Do you see that? It means, I don't care if you call it tithing. I don't care if you call it Sabbath worship and you actually worship on the Sabbath rather than the first day. Sabbatarians, listen to no, I can say it. If you did listen to them, they got to constantly mention that the sixth day is the Sabbath day. And they are right. But you ought to worship Christ on the Sabbath day and on the first day and on the second day and third and fourth and fifth equally. And not after Christ, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are what? Complete. Amen. In him. He, in other words, Joe, he's like that big, nice Thanksgiving meal. And you eat, probably turkey's probably an unclean animal, ain't it? I know swine's flesh is. You bunch of sinners, you. And you eat, and you eat, and you eat, and you are stuffed. Yep. But you look over at that dessert. Do you stop? <laughs> Maybe some of us do. But do you look over? Well, I'm full. Now let me Christ, we're, we're complete in him. We're full in him. But you know what? I still want to eat and eat and eat and nibble a little here and nibble a little there. And if you don't, you've never really met Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing number 68 and we'll be closed with that.